Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Stanford with Parviz Moyn. I'm going to talk today about the real-world application of multi-physics computational fluid dynamics. Parviz, where does computational fluid dynamics fit into what you're trying to do with turbulence? Well, what uh, I am doing is using high-fidelity numerical simulations to compute turbulent flows. Uh, and try to get as much of the details of turbulence as possible that will, and ultimately, of course, we are interested in predict qualities of practical interest, such as, as you can see, the lift and drag on, on, a, uh, on an aircraft, and, uh, and ultimately be able to control, in addition to prediction of uh, these forces on aircraft, we are also interested in uh, control the, the turbulence to, to reduce, for example, the drag, uh, to uh, reduce noise uh, propagation, and uh, many other qualities of engineering interest that uh, one might be able to, if they did a handle the turbulence, be able to uh, control them. What's changed over maybe the past five years, though, in terms of what you can do now versus what you could do before? We have had s several developments that has happened uh, that have happened in the past five years. One has been advanced algorithms that uh, numerical methods that uh, we are using that are particularly suitable for capturing turbulent flows to predict turbulent flows. The other one is that we have access now with the advanced chips with GPUs. We have gained about an order of magnitude at the very least over the just past five years. Same code but with the GPUs that uh, we can uh, have an enhanced performance. So what does that do? That means that the faster chips will allow us either to do more complex problems or the problems that we are working on, we can get a turnaround time that is much, much faster. And that's what the, the designers would like to have. So when you look at the picture behind you, the this is really what's going on when you're flying in an airplane, right? You right. don't necessarily see any of this stuff. As a matter of fact, if you did, you'd probably be in complete right. panic mode. But as you look at this stuff, there's a pattern in here too, right? That you can start identifying. Right. So what, what you see, there is the, the turbulence, the flow turbulence is all over this wing that you're seeing. Uh, it is the, the details of this turbulence the turbulent flows, which are these revolving fluid motions that are, are there that are the main contributors to, for example, skin friction drag on, on an aircraft. But you also see the largest features that uh, uh, come from uh, uh, various corners and, and parts of the aircraft at the, the leading edge, at the tip of the wing, etc., that we are also able to see now uh, precisely by by flow visualization. This is an example of the most complex, I would say, calculations that have ever been undertaken. And uh, it takes uh, roughly the order of 96 GPUs. We can do this calculation in a matter of a uh, few hours. Uh, years ago, this was only a dream to be able to capture this kind of detail on the flow over an aircraft. But now you can do it in real time and, and uh, uh, it, it, again, a matter of hours that we can do. Before, it would have taken months to be able to do this cal kind of calculation, so we wouldn't do it. Is it going to get even faster? I mean, as we, as we start really revving up uh, the, the new chips that are coming out, we move into uh, 3D ICs, for example. Will this now become significantly faster, and what can you do with that extra speed? Well, the turnaround time will be a lot faster. So when you start the calculation until you get the results, you can do it much quicker. In the design process, you can ask what if type questions much more readily and quickly. That, uh, and that's what you are very much interested in. Or you can add, start having the, the grid finer and start capturing more of the details of permanence and rely less on phenomenological models. So the more uh, grid points you put in to resolve the phenomena, that means you rely less on uh, phenomenological models that you have to use to capture the smallest possible features. So that aspect of it is going, you are going to be moved more and more towards first principles.
Parmes, what are we looking at here? This is a nozzle of a, a jet engine, an exhaust of a, a jet engine. If you have seen the uh, modern, even commercial aircraft, you see these chevrons that are put in at the end of the, the nozzle. And you will see, and we are trying to study the effect of those chevrons that you saw at the very beginning here. These are put in place there so that to uh, affect the noise, reduce the noise uh, coming out of it. What you're looking at here is a simulation of that phenomenon. And uh, you're seeing the details of, uh, uh, at this point, you're looking at the temperature, surface of temperature, and you see the details in, in this picture. And these are caused by turbulence. It's the unsteadiness of these eddies that are uh, moving around that are cause the, the noise that is uh, being generated. Now, when we do computations, of course, we put a, uh, we discretize the governing equations, which are well known, the Navier-Stokes equations, and then put a grid on, on it, three-dimensional and time in the space. The more grid points that we put in, in uh, there, use them, which of course cost more, it takes more time on the computers. Uh, by the way, this calculation was the first calculation that was done with one million cores, and one million cores on the Sequoia supercomputer that just would, uh, came to, uh, to Livermore. Uh, and uh, you do see that here, the computational noise, uh, uh, the, the, the blue lines are the noise that is generated from this uh, jet. Hot gases are coming out from this. And we're talking about a jet engine, but this can just as easily apply to a fan on a computer. It can apply to a, a windmill too, right? Definitely, it does, and, and uh, it's being used for that purpose. Uh, you can compute the noise coming from a fan. Uh, you can uh, even uh, look at the erosion on uh, wind turbines. That's for many applications. Uh, it has to do also with the atmospheric turbulence, oceanic currents. Many cases, turbulence is there, but always is there. It's, it's a, is, is basically rule, not exception in, in fluid dynamics. And uh, the, the issue with turbulence is that it is so, it's multi-scale, both in time and space. And the more you want to resolve it, the more computer power is required. And uh, of course, less phenomenology and assumptions will be made so the things become much more accurate. And you've been talking about a million cores. Really, right now we're into tens and hundreds of billions of cores and we're heading up into trillions. So what you're going to be able to do with this in the future, it's going to be much different than what you can do today, right? That's right, that's right. Again, things that become uh, more rapidly, we can do it, but certain phenomena like uh, chemical reactions or phase change, liquid uh, evaporating, uh, it's, those phenomena, now we are able to even more accurately represent them. So now, now that you have this capability, you know, where do you go in the future? What's, what's going to be the next big thing that you can do? Well, the, the, we are now able to handle complex configurations. We are hand, able to handle uh, complex engineering systems involving multi-physics. Uh, it involves fluid dynamics, planes, uh, noise, particles being uh, transported, uh, whether it's pollutants or soot, or uh, all of these physical phenomena that have been intractable in, in, in the past, to capture them in a, a high fidelity fashion, in, in more credible calculations. Now we are able to get, get towards that, uh, be able to capture that. Uh, formation, wave breaking in oceans, and the formation of bubbles, carbon sequestration that we, we, we would have. Uh, that physical, these phenomena now we are, they, they involve details of turbulence, turbulent mixing, and now we can approach like microscope, get there and try to understand uh, how they are formed, these phenomena, and uh, how they, uh, the dynamics of them. And, uh, and ultimately, of course, you would like to be able to control them in, in a uh, way that you can you can get the harness the benefits of that. 
Do digital twins apply in this as well? Is that really what you're creating? Is sort of a digital twin of what's happening? The digital twin, yes, it is not the simulation. The digital twin is not the simulation. It is uh, a real time, is a reduced order model, I would say, of a complex physical system that lets you uh, to go there and get the real time data. Now, to make a, a digital twin, uh, you need a lot of data to be able to uh, form the parameters of the, of the twin. And that data can come from these high fidelity uh, simulations. Uh, then you can again ask what if type uh, uh, questions, scenarios. The speed up of these simulations really allows, opens up doors for asking what if type questions without having to go and do prototyping, building things and testing in the physical facility. And many times you can't even do that. Um, you, you worry about the behavior of a spacecraft on the planet Mars, you re-enter Mars. We can't test that here. You have to rely on simulations. So there are many cases that you can try, as long as you have a credible simulation, in, and you can test it in conditions similar to what you might uh, encounter, uh, then, then you can, that's where the simulations come in. Where do machine learning and AI fit into this as you go forward? Machine learning and, uh, and AI will uh, help or can help the parameterization of the scales that we are not able to, to capture, um, uh, what we call in the turbulence modeling phenomena. It, it will, using massive data from multiple uh, scenarios, it would help us to refine those phenomenological models. But extrapolation is the key thing. I mean, you have data that you can uh, then put all of the data together and come up with a reduced order model. But to go beyond that, uh, to go outside of the range of data that you have used to tool your, your models in the, in the machine, with machine learning, for example, I mean, you haven't seen that whether that is possible. For example, you use the data for one of these aircraft simulations that we, we just saw, and then, um, but if you go to a higher speed, for example, or, or a different scenario, uh, that model that you have come up with may, may not be accurate anymore. This is the whole problem with what if, right? You need the data to be able to base that what if conclusion on. It is, that's right. It is, you need the data and it helps you to interpolate within that domain of the data. And, but it's not going to be very helpful if you want to extrapolate to go beyond the range of applicability of the data. All this technology though has changed what you can do in, in turbulence research, right? I mean, the complexity of the configuration and to, to do realistic simulations. We used to do, uh, uh, simulations of pipes and channels and, and uh, that very simple devices. Now you're looking at the full aircraft. Next thing would be powered aircraft. That actually the engine uh, be uh, what you saw in, the, in our previous uh, uh, views, the flow was going through the engine. But now you actually have a power uh, in, in the engine and all of that can be self-contained. Fascinating subject. Parpe's mind, thanks for a great explanation. You're very welcome.